Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, we want to welcome you to the first Kingdomizer Network webinar with Daryl Miller. We're glad to have you joining us and trust that this will be an enlightening time of learning and growing. The topic we've decided to focus on today is development. Daryl has written and spoken on this subject for over 30 years and has a depth of insight and experience that will encourage and inspire you in the work you are doing or you want to do. Daryl will talk about the journey of development he has traveled on and about a paper he has written that will be the focus of our upcoming meetings together. Please listen carefully and take notes. And once Daryl has finished, we'll devote some time to answering your questions. Or if you prefer, you can type your question in the chat box. We are recording this session and we'll share it with you and the rest of the Kingdomizer network in, in this month's email. So feel free to share it with others once you receive it. So let's get started. Um, today we have uh, Jonathan joining us from, uh, can you tell us where you're from, Jonathan? I'm joining from Nigeria, Plateau State, West Africa. Perfect. Well, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. I know we have others joining us, but due to some internet connections, they're in and out. So we're just going to get started and, and people can join as we as we go along. Um, again, uh, we're, we're blessed to have Darrow with us. Darrow is a co-founder of the Disciple Nations Alliance. He is an international speaker, written numerous books, on worldview and um, and culture and poverty. And uh, today, Daryl is going to talk with us a little bit about the, the development ethic. It's a paper that he's written, and he wants to tell us a little bit about why he wrote that paper and his journey um, in the development world. So, Daryl, thanks for joining us, and um, please take it away. It's good to be with you. And for those of you that are listening now or will listen in the future, welcome. We're excited to begin this journey. I'm excited to begin this journey with you. I know Sean's been engaging with you some time, and I'm looking forward to the times we have together. The subject that Sean wanted to talk about or wanted us to begin to talk about is the development ethic. And I thought the place really to begin is how I came to articulate this concept of the development ethic and how that has shaped the Disciple Nations Alliance and the message of the Disciple Nations Alliance. My story begins when I was in college and I began my journey as what I would call an evangelical socialist. I was a devoted Christian, Bible-believing Christian who was confronted with poverty. And I thought at that point, because I had been educated in public schools, that the root of poverty was primarily a lack of resources, lack of money. And so the way I thought you solved the problem of poverty was through a socialist scheme of giving money from one person to another, from wealthy countries to poor countries, from wealthy individuals to poor individuals. And that's where, where I began when I was in my early 20s. One of the things that uh, primarily shaped me was a trip when I was at university with a group of other young Christians to Mexico City. And I remember traveling by train from Mexicali, Mexico to Mexico City, three days, two nights on the train. And the further south we went, the greater the poverty. And when I got to Mexico City, our team stayed in an orphanage. And we ate the same food that the children in the orphanage ate. I remember they didn't have money for fish, but they had money for fish head. So we had fish head soup quite often. 
And it was my first experience with being confronted personally with poverty. And God used that to change my life. I remember as the train pulled into Mexico City, we pulled in through a, a slum and people were living in houses made out of trash. And children were pay, playing in piles of garbage, looking for things to eat, looking for things they could use as toys. And I wept. And that was a turning point in my life. Um, I came away from that experience thinking, the Lord is wanting me to see that there's less poverty in the world when I die than there was at that moment, and that I was to give my life in some way to countering poverty in our world. A few years later, I was married, and my wife and I were at Labrie uh, in Switzerland. This was a Christian community hosted by Francis and Edith Schaefer. If you have not heard from them, of, of them. And I remember one night in, uh, it was a February night, we were in the Swiss Alps. There was a group of us sitting around a table having sandwiches and tea. There were cut dried flowers from the Alpine forest and the snow was falling outside the window and there was classical music playing. It's an incredible, setting. And my host was a German lawyer named Udo Middleman. He, and he turned to me and he said, you know, Darrow, Christianity is true, even if you don't believe it. And that was a shock to me. Because my life since I become a Christian was that it was true, because I believed it. And here's somebody telling me it's true, whether I believe it or not. And I said, Udo, say, what, what did you just say? I don't understand that. And he said it again. Christianity is true whether you believe it or not. I didn't sleep for two nights. I don't know how many of you listening to this webinar uh, have had those nights, those sleepless nights of asking questions and wondering what is happening. And this was, I had a couple nights like that where I didn't sleep tossing and turning, and I finally realized what Udo was saying. He was saying that Christianity was true even if no one in the world believed it. It was true because God exists. And those two events in my late teens, early 20s were profound in, in shaping my life. I came to see the importance of what we talk about at the DNA as world view. When I came to work at Food for the Hungry some 40, 45 years ago, an organization that I served with for 27 years, the first trip I took was to the Dominican Republic to a small community called Constanza up in the mountains of the DR. It was a beautiful, place. It reminded me of Switzerland without the snow, mountains surrounding this valley, fertile soil, river running through the valley. You could throw seeds on the ground and that would be all you'd have to do to get a crop. And yet the people in the valley were very poor. But I noticed up on the side of the hill overlooking the valley, there were some what we call today middle class homes. And I said, who lives in those homes? And somebody said, the Japanese. Well, that was, what are the Japanese doing here? Uh, they're a long way from Japan, but it turns out that at the end of World War II, Japan was uh, in desolation in one sense, and people left Japan, went all over the world in a Japanese diaspora. And some of them came to the Caribbean, some to the Dominican Republic, and some made their way to this fertile valley. And within two generations, they were thriving. And I started to ask the question, how come the Japanese are thriving and the Dominicans who've lived here for generations are barely getting by? And I began to ask people, tell me what, what's happening here? And, 
somebody said, you know, we Dominicans were fatalistic. It's part of our culture. We were born poor and we're going to die poor. Our parents were born poor. Our grandparents were poor. Our children are born poor and there's nothing we can do about it. And I said, well, what about the Japanese? And someone said, uh, Daryl, they have a phrase, gambare. And I said, what is gambare? And they said, it means never give up, try harder. And at that moment, I had an epiphany. I had this aha moment. And you hear us talking a lot at the DNA about the aha moment when, oh, now I understand. And I had been looking at poverty from a naturalistic, atheistic, materialistic model. And uh, the people of the Dominican Republic were poor not because there wasn't a land, a flourishing land where they lived, not because there weren't resources, they had a myriad of resources but they were poor because they were fatalistic. They thought there was nothing they could do about their poverty. And the Japanese who'd come to the Dominican Republic with no money and the clothes on their back had prospered in two generations because of Gambare. Never give up, try harder. And at that moment, I realized that the root cause of poverty was not a material root. It was a root of worldview, of mindset. And this uh, was a profound, brought a profound change in my life. Most of the world today focuses on physical capital. If a person is poor, it's because they do not have money, they do not have natural resources. So what is needed is to give them money, give them physical capital. And I came to realize that the root of poverty is what you would call metaphysical capital. It has nothing to do with the physical realm, but everything to do with the way people see the world. An example of this in many countries that are impoverished, they see work as a curse. And if you see work as a curse, then that will have an economic impact on the person, on the community, on the nation. Another example, and I say this is the greatest, one of the greatest causes of poverty in the world, it's a lie that men are superior to women. And virtually everywhere you go in the world, that lie is propagated. Men are superior to women. No, the truth is that women are made in the image of God. The truth is, work is part of our dignity. And these were things that began to, a seed began to sprout that day in Constanza, where I began to look at the concept of, if you want to really help people come out of poverty, you need to help them have a biblical worldview, a way, the, the way, of seeing the world in the way that God made it. So from there, I began to develop the concept of a development ethic. What are those key worldview ideas that if understood can bring individuals and communities to the aha moment and say, oh, it is important to realize that women are made in the image of God. 
And that should have an impact on my life and the life of the church and the life of the community. Time is going somewhere. It's not the fatalistic life on the wheel where things just repeat themselves over and over again. Another thing is that the system that we live in is an open system. It's open to God's intervention. He's the one that made the universe, made the cosmos, and he can intervene, angels can intervene, and human beings can intervene. And this open system is in contrast to the closed system of an atheistic materialistic worldview, where people say that resources are finite, they're things in the ground, and people are hungry because they do not have resources. So I began to read, there weren't many books written about this, back in those days. I began to read and I read several books. One was a book by Barbara Ward on uh, why are some nations rich and some poor. Another book was by Abraham Kuyper, a Dutch worldview somebody who understand, stood worldview, who became a pastor, who became a member of parliament and eventually became the prime minister of Holland. And he wrote a book called The Stone, that's called The Stone Lectures because he saw this secular atheistic worldview coming into the United States. It had already come into Europe. And he decided to go to the States and teach at Princeton University, which was the leading evangelical seminary at the time. And he gave a series of lectures called the Stone Lectures. And when I read those, I thought, Kuiper is talking about development. And that was such a profound um, revelation to me. He was talking about Christianity as a worldview not simply as a faith, that Christianity is a way of seeing the world that comports with reality. And in this series of lectures, he divided them into three major factors, the creation factor, the human factor, and the uh, God factor. And in each of these, I discovered there were key ideas, worldview concepts. And from that, I developed the series of uh, writings called the Development Ethic that have become known through the book, Discipling Nations, the power of truth to transform culture. So that's the a short version of my journey of how I got from a 19 year old who had a heart broken for poverty to the point where I am today, where the Disciple Nations Alliance is today in promoting biblical principle and biblical worldview for the practical solutions to issues of hunger and poverty. Now I'll stop there and see what questions uh, you might have. I'm looking forward to having a, a good discussion with you. You're muted. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Um, if you want to ask a question, just um, click on your mute button, unmute yourself, feel free to ask a question. To Daryl, if you prefer to write it in the chat box, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. 
Hello, Stefan. Do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yes, uh, I've just joined. I've just joined right now. I've been a uh, little bit disturbed by the by the network, but I've just joined from Uganda, Africa. Happy being here. I'm ready to work with you. Okay. Hi, okay. Stefan. Hi. Jonathan has a question to it, Sean. Hey, Jonathan. He needs to know. Yes. I have a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, I appreciate Daru for, 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 for this insight about the development ethics. Now, the, Daru painted out a clear picture of my Nigerian context when he mentioned the issue of uh, fatalism uh, we are born poor and there is nothing we can do about it. So many people are with disbelief in Nigeria and even in my community. Now I was privileged a year before, uh, a, a, two years back to visit a village uh, with my uncle where we try to encourage the villagers to plant economic trees. Now, an old man came that he cannot uh, plant a tree that is not going to be a beneficiary to that tree. That before getting to that age where the, 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 the trees will start bearing fruit, that before then, uh, uh, he's thinking before that years, uh, he will die. So what we try to do, we encourage them, but people are still with the belief that uh, even economic tree that we try to encourage them, that will change their situation. Now, Darrow painted out another picture of the Japanese, where they have a slogan that never give up. Now, the question is, how can we help some of our people that are still with the belief of this uh, fatalistic uh, worldview? Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's a good question. There'd be several things I'd say. First, we need pastors and teachers need to begin teaching the word of God from Genesis 1, not Genesis 3. Very seldom do you hear pastors teaching on Sunday morning from Genesis 1 and 2. This is Genesis, the first three chapters of Genesis are where so much of biblical worldview is laid out. And most people, most pastors begin, and I, we, we call them at the DNA, Genesis 3 Christians. They start reading the Bible. They start teaching from Genesis 3, not Genesis 1. And so part of it is we need to begin to study the Bible, read the Bible. Pastors need to begin preaching from Genesis 1. Two and three. Otherwise, you start with the fall, and everything focuses on Christ and the cross. And the cross is the center point of history. That is true. Mm -hmm. But what are we here for? And that's what's put forward in Genesis 1 and 2. So I would say that's a critical thing is to begin teaching from there. Another thing, and this is much more difficult, is to begin schools for children who teach biblical principle and biblical worldview. Most of us simply put our, our kids in 
whatever the local school is. And that local school is going to teach whatever the, cult, the cultural worldview is of a nation and a community. And that's going to make the next generation of citizens and leaders. It's going to make them just like the current and the past generation. Because you're not discipling the children and you're not discipling the congregation at the level of culture. So as evangelicals and charismatic Christians, we may go out and preach the gospel. We may talk about the Holy Spirit. We may talk about Christ. But we don't disciple at the level of culture. So to summarize, begin reading and teaching from Genesis 1, not Genesis 3. Have the concept of discipling at the level of culture and have the concept of creating education for our children and the next generation that is biblical. Those would be some places to start. Thank you. You're welcome, Jonathan. Yeah. Um... Thank you. I am uh, by the name's Apostle Alex Stefan Opio. I am in Uganda, Africa. Hi, uh, Stefan. Yes, I am happy to be here. And also, I am uh, one of uh, the people that like discipleship, though I need knowledge and I need uh, their empowerment, like the way. I've been welcome here. However, I am sorry to join late the journey, though I am yearning. I've been interrupted by the network. So I don't know whether you could help me. Maybe I can remain in, on Zoom so that someone who is with me can guide me on what people have discussed because I cannot or comment on the, something that I've not had. So I was praying that if time is over, maybe some, someone can give me a brief overview of our meeting here today and uh, the way forward. Thank you. Well, the good news is this is being recorded and Sean will be sending a link out to kingdomizers around the world where they can link in and hear what we're talking about today and hear my initial presentation. So you'll be able to catch up. All right, yeah, Stefan, we also, yes, yeah, Stefan, we also have, um, I, I'll be happy to engage with you uh, through WhatsApp or through email, but we have a lot of resources uh, that we can make available to you for discipleship. So. Um, we can have this discussion, and I'd be happy to do that. Jonathan, go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you once more. Uh, that way, in the course of uh, your presentation, you, you mentioned that our system is open to God's innovation. Can you share more light to that point, please? Sure. This is a critical thing to understand, Jonathan, so I'm glad you've, you've brought this up. Most of us are educated in public schools, and in public schools, we are taught by an atheistic worldview. We're taught Darwin. We're here by accident. We're here by chance. And... This is what we understand from our public education. There is no God. We are here through the process of evolution. And we think, automatically think, because this is how we've been taught to think, that the system, the universe is closed. It's just like a big machine. But the we are confronted by scripture that God exists. He existed before the universe. He imagined the universe. And then he created the universe. 
And in Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2, and the world was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And if you think in terms of an artist who begins with a blank canvas or somebody who uh, works with clay to make pots and different things, God, when he began, he imagined the universe and then he made the raw materials. And then in the rest of Genesis chapter one, there are stages of forming those materials into higher and higher forms. So he shapes the clay as it were, forms it some more, forms it some more. And each time he stands back and he said, oh, this is good, this is good. And then he comes to the point of making human beings in his own image, Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. And he makes us in his image as he is a creator. We are made to be creative. We're made to analyze things and solve problems. We're made to dream dreams and seek the fulfillment of those dreams. So the system that God has made is open to God's input, and it is also open to human input. So if you have a mindset or the worldview that you are merely an animal, and you're here just to survive, and the theme is survival of the fittest, the strongest, the most fit survive, everybody else dies off. That's one way of, in your mind, framing the world. It's not biblical, it's not true. What is true and what is biblical is that before creation existed, God existed. And when he made us, he made us like himself. He made us to take what he had made and do something with it. So we're not just to be here and eat what's in the garden. We're to expand the garden. We're to create vineyards and orchards. We're to create music and poetry. We're to create beautiful colors and beautiful cloth. And God wants this world to be flourishing. He wants it to be more bountiful after you and I live than it was at the end of his creative process. He made us to take what he has done and create bounty from it. That's an open system. And Jonathan, if you have that in your mind, you have exploded the small box of atheistic materialistic culture. You have exploded the small box of fatalism. And all of a sudden, your mind is expanded to see reality the way God has made it and to begin to function within that reality. I hope that's clear and helpful. Yes. Feel free to so push much. it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Someone else, Mohammed. Hi, everyone. Hey, hey. Mohammed. When I I'm see you to... off in your driving. Yeah, I was now I, I pull over and I'm listening to the webinar, so it is very interesting for me. Good. 
Yeah, what so questions thank you, you bring? Yeah, thank you for sharing your story. So it is very encouraging to me, especially so. Good. Uh, yeah, so there's many questions uh, comes to my mind. Also, I, I, well, I want to say thank you because you share with us from the beginning of your story and how you developed this uh, development ethics. So you shared how the beginning is and how, uh, uh, how you, what, what is your world view now? So this is uh, one of the questions that I, that I had uh, from from uh, people who follow us in in the Middle East. Is sometimes, uh, uh, for example, they when they follow our resources in Arabic. And they, I, they understand, for example, many things. They have this aha moment. Okay, uh, for example, the, uh, the work is not a, a curse, for, for example, for for them. They understand the work is a, is a blessing. But Good. sometimes they, they say, what if if the boss, for example, their boss in in in, in where they in where they work. Uh, uh, he, he, for example, he didn't behave with them in a good way. So, uh -huh. yeah, and uh, for example, respect them. How they can, uh, uh, so how can how can how they can keep their their thoughts? For example, this this work that we are working in is a blessing, is not a curse. With this, for example, strong conditions and many obstacles from the team or from the boss where they work this is especially for a uh, middle east in north africa yeah. well i would so. say it, it may be in the middle east and north africa but what you've described is very often found in other parts of the world so it, it's not that uh, uncommon i think we need to function as as followers of christ based on the reality of the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming of the kingdom of God, not on the context that our culture puts us in. So that, that would be the first thing. Be a rebel. Don't, don't be put in a, a small box by your, in this case that you've described, your existing employer. Take, the, take it seriously that God has made you to work. He's made you to be creative. And as an employee, do good work. Do excellent work. Be a person that solves problems in your company. And I think just the fact that you function in this way, it will make you stand out from other employees. And if a company is going to be successful, they're going to need people like you. And I would encourage your, your, uh, the people that you're working with who are in this situation to take some lessons from the materials we've written on life work on the forest and the seed, these kind of resources, and it will give them a bigger space in their mind to function uh, in their culture. Something else to consider, and I don't know if you've come across um, uh, Ina Richard yet. Are you familiar with her? She's part of the DNA network. You know of her? Mm -hmm. Ina uh, Richards sorry. is, go ahead. Can you, can you repeat the name, please? Ina Richards. Uh, yeah, 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 I saw that video. Yeah. yeah, she started a program called Work for a Living in South Africa. And she trains very, uh, impoverished youth in South Africa in the culture of being an employee. What are the virtues that a person needs to be a good employee? 
not she doesn't train them in skills but the virtues of work she has a whole curriculum it's spread all over africa and through her contact with the dna it's spreading into south america now she's getting it into north america she's got people in asia now who are teaching this curriculum and what she's found is when she trains young people in the virtues of work and then they get a job their boss likes what they're doing and he says we need more people like this or Ina, will you come and teach our people because these people become more productive more creative and the potential of the organization grows and most not all but most bosses appreciate this so she's got a whole curriculum of material to train young people in in the virtues of work and now she has developed a curriculum in entrepreneurship teaching them how to start their own businesses so i would say for those of you that are listening ina richards and work for a living is a great resource for the practical question that you have asked muhammad what do we do if we have a heart to work, but what do we do in the workplace uh, when it, the workplace itself may not support that? How do we change the culture of the workplace? That helpful? Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you very much. And yeah. if, if you have trouble finding uh, work for a living, Sean can help you get there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Eugene, hello, welcome. Hello, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Are you Chris's son? Yes, please, I am. <laughs> I thought, I looked at the name Ampadu and I thought, oh, I know Ampadu. This must <laughs> be one of his kids. <laughs> Eugene yeah. was just in, in uh, Ethiopia at the Forum. Okay, Where did you have a good time there? Oh yes, yes, it was it was really good. I think that was even where I met. If I'm sure, I met Mohammed. Um, I'm there, and we were able to really connect with people from all over and really hear what God is doing. You know, that's through, great. Um, the practice, so it was a blessing. Good. Do you have a question? Oh, um, I so first of all, I'm um, sorry. Just got in. We had to travel to visit patients here in Sierra Leone now, so got back pretty late and um just jumped on in and um for me first of all is it's been first of all a blessing being able to put um these things to practice where I am now because it has really impacted the way I see you know the patients we work with and the way I see hope you know yes. with them you know every time we 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 serve them because at one end you are seeing um tumors and poverty and devastation but in the midst of it you are seeing practically how um, god sees them you know just seeing both of it at the same time seeing how god sees them seeing how as an instrument in his hand i can reflect his mind you know That's in the great. way i interact with them it's it's been such a, a blessing here and yeah. in our onboarding we use uh, uh um, some of the modules come up you know kingdom culture and everything and it's, it's it's been a blessing being able to walk it out um here um with mercy Chief. so i don't have a question but i just want to ex express that yeah it's it's a big blessing to know that and to be able to be part of it great well say hello to your dad and mom for me yeah. and tell your dad i'm excited about this new uh venture he's involved in and I actually have a letter in my mind that I want to write to him because of what he's doing. And time is short, so it's like I need to get time to write him. But let him know I owe him a letter and I'll get back to him. Yes, please. I will. 
Thank you so much. Yes. Daryl, I have a question for you. You mentioned yeah. the idea, uh, and I think it leads into a lot with um, with development, is that Christianity isn't just a faith, but it's a worldview. Can you expound on that just for a couple of minutes? Yes. Uh, where to start? There's so much to say about that, Sean. Uh, let me put it this way. I'll say it this way. The God that you worship, what is his character? What is the nature of the God or gods that you worship? And the nature of the God or gods that you worship is reflected in your culture. And then the culture that you live in is upstream from economics, from politics, from education, from every other institution in a society is shaped by the culture. So when you hear us say we need to disciple at the level of culture, most of the time within the church, we talk about evangelism, leading people to Christ, getting them saved, getting them to come to the church and to the programs of the church. That's evangelism. Some groups go beyond evangelism and say, well, we need to disciple people in the spiritual disciplines. We need to disciple them, to teach them to pray, to read the Bible to a witness to Christ, to fellowship together. These are the disciplines. And new Christians need to be discipled in the disciplines. That's not what we're talking about the, at the Disciple Nations Alliance. We are suggesting that people, Christians need to disciple at the level of culture. What is the biblical worldview? It's not just it. We are to come to Christ and the cross, but it's not simply coming to Christ in the, in the cross in an animistic context, in a materialistic context. No, the Bible presents what we call the biblical worldview, and that worldview comports with reality. And this we go through in the months ahead, the development ethic, you will see the relationship between the development ethic, these principles that come from a biblical worldview for development, and how they apply and work. When the DNA talks about worldview, we're not talking about it as an abstract concept. We're talking about worldview applied. If you go to a school and they're teaching worldview, well, you learn it academically. We're not talking about academics. We're talking about the application. A friend of ours, Arturo Cuba, and we have a whole series of teachings on our website from Arturo Cuba. He worked in Guatemala, and then the last 20 years, he's been living and working in Bolivia. But I remember, uh, when I was in Guatemala visiting him 30 years ago, he said, uh, he, he told me this story. He was working with um, non-literate pastors in very poor communities in the poorest uh, state of Guatemala, the Pocomchi, I think they were called. Mm -hmm. And every day, Every week he went and worked with a group of pastors who were not literate, who could not read the Bible, and he taught them scriptures from Genesis 1 and 2. He taught them about worldview. And he told the story, he was in the home of one of the farmer pastors that he was mentoring. And these people lived in one room houses with a dirt floor with three stones in the middle of the 
of their house where they cooked. The smoke would fill the house when they cooked. The corn that they'd harvested was stacked in one corner of the house. And the rats lived in the corn. And the rats were fat. And his children were starving. And Arturo was with this farmer and pastor in his house. And he said, who's smart here? You are the rats. And they laughed and they said, oh, the rats. The rats are smarter. <laughs> they understood the rats, the rats were fat. They, they were eating the corn. And Arturo had taught them from Genesis 1 that as image bearers of God, they're to have dominion over creation. And he said, who is to have dominion here. You are the rats. And from being taught the Bible, even though they couldn't read and write, they said, I'm to have dominion over the rats. Well, up until that point, it was sort of like, okay, they knew something, but they didn't know it. And at that moment, they had the aha. Oh, I understand now. The rats aren't to have dominion over me and my house. I am to have dominion over my rats, over the rats. Now there's a space in their mind that wasn't there before. The space is how do I have dominion over the rats? What can I do to protect my corn from the rats? Now there's a space in their mind where they could begin to apply a biblical worldview concept that we are made in the image of God and are to have dominion over creation. So they began to figure out ways to protect their harvest from the rats. So this is we need to think in these terms. It's worldview applied, not just worldview abstract. And the application of worldview is in these principles or what we call the development ethic, understanding those and then acting upon them, living in the reality of them. Does that help, Sean? Yeah, that does help. I thought that was very insightful. I We've talked about these things a lot, but the difference of seeing Christianity just as a faith that uh, we live now and we can't wait to live in the future in the heaven and king, in the kingdom of God manifests versus engaging with God in the here and now to extend his kingdom through our lives. That's a, that's a radical concept, I think. So. Well, and th that's rooted, Sean, I think, as we know, if we have the sacred secular divide in our minds, if we think like Greeks, not like the Bible, we're only interested in spiritual things. Mm -hmm. So we're only interested in faith. We're interested in Sundays, not Mondays. Uh, we're interested in worship, not work. Mm -hmm. But from a biblical worldview, there's not the sacred secular divide. Mm -hmm. Everything in reality becomes sacred. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to understand that and function from that, everything changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why we focus on Christianity as a worldview. Not, and I'm not saying it's opposed to merely faith. Mm -hmm. But it's a deeper understanding of what it is we have faith in. That's mm -hmm. the nature and character of God and how he made the universe. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's really great. I appreciate that. Well, Eugene, you have a question. If you have a question, we'd love to entertain it. If not, then we will move on. Um, apparently not. 
Okay. I'm still I'm taking it in. Perfect. Great. Well, like I mentioned at the beginning, we've recorded this session and we're going to send it out in the Kingdomizer Network email this month, along with uh, some other resources. And <clears throat> also to point out that we're going to be meeting in the next uh, few months and getting into the, the nuts and bolts of a, of a paper that Darrow has written called The Development Ethic. Uh, we will also send you a, a link to that uh, paper, and we're going to spend some time having Darrow uh, discuss that paper uh, and giving you an opportunity to ask questions in relation to that. Um, we, uh, as you have heard today, there's there's a lot of things we can talk about. There's a lot of discussion questions that we could continue to uh, ask and unpack, um, and we we want to do that in the upcoming months. So we look forward to uh, to the upcoming events and and engaging with you. And if you have a friend that you want to bring with you, we'd love to see that happen as well. Once you get the recording, you want to share that with your network or a friend or two. Please do that as well. But um, we again, we're going to send out a uh, a link to that that paper and we'd like to have you engage with it in the in the upcoming email you'll uh, get an understanding of what we're going to focus on in our next time together and um, and I hope that this is a, a good appetizer it kind of what's what's your appetite for more uh, discussion more engagement along this line of seeing Christianity bigger than just a faith that we practice on Sundays but as a worldview in which we a lens through which we look at all of life and we interpret all of life, and then we ap apply that in the way that we live our lives. Um, we have the greatest message that there is for the world to know. And we uh, have fallen short in so many ways as the church in expressing and, and putting that on display. But I think that this uh, discussion and this paper will be really helpful for us as we as we try to do that. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for joining us today. I want to close our time in prayer, and uh, and then and thank you, Daryl, for taking the time and the energy to engage with us and to answer our questions. My pleasure. I love uh, we, doing this. Yeah, we're we're grateful to you as well for all the time and attention you've given to it. So let me say a prayer, and we will close our time together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are. Uh, as we've talked about today, we just thank you for the your nature and your character and the way you've explained and expressed yourself to us that the God of the universe, the, the creator of all that we know and see, has called us to himself, has called us to into relationship, who has forgiven us, who has redeemed us, who has put us on a path of loving you and following you and be an expression of you into the world that we live in. We thank you for that. And, and what a what a great privilege and opportunity you've given us. Uh, Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters who have joined us today in our call. We pray that you bless them and um, help them in the work that they are doing. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand deeper and deeper um, what it means to disciple at the level of culture, what it means to follow you and to think according to your word and to your ways, and help us to distinguish between the culture that we've grown up in and the ways that our culture thinks uh, compared to the ways that your word expresses that we should think and the way that we should interpret life and how we should align our thinking and our acting according to you and your ways. Lord, may your word become real and more true and more exciting to us, even in the upcoming weeks, more so than it has ever before. May we see in it uh, ways that we can follow you, ways that you're calling us to yourself, and ways that we can express you in the world that we live in. So we pray your blessings upon Darrow. Thank you for his time with us today and all the experiences that you've given him and the insights he's sharing with us. And we pray your blessing on our friends. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified. You would use us to be an expression of your kingdom. May your kingdom come 
on earth, Lord, as it is in heaven for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you again. Thank you all. Hope to see you in another month. <laughs>